Welcome to the Indusoft bi-monthly webinar. My name is Marcia Gabois, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Today, we'll be discussing Wonderware Online and its use in IoT, Industrial 4.0, and Made in China 2025. There are many applications where one may consider connecting Indusoft Web Studio in embedded devices to a relational database or Wonderware Online. This includes physically dispersed applications in an infrastructure industry, smart city applications, uh, smart irrigation, which I'll be talking about later. Wonderware Online is a high-performance process historian capable of storing huge volumes of data generated for today's industrial facilities. This data historian easily retrieves and securely delivers information to desktop and mobile devices, enabling organizations to analyze processes anywhere at any time. Our speaker today is Raymond Norman, a principal system consultant at Wonderware. Ray is a wealth of knowledge on the Wonderware portfolio and how it integrates and works together to provide solutions, so I'm honored to have him here. I'm going to begin by just giving you a brief overview of the industry, and then I'll turn it over for, to Ray so he can give you details about uh, the Wonderware Online. First, Gartner forecasted that that's, Gartner forecasts that 6.4 billion connected things will be used in the world in 2016. That's up 30 percent from 2015 and will reach 20.8 billion by 2020. In 2016, 5.5 million new things will get connected every day. That's mind-boggling. Oops. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I – sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Let me go back. Uh, basically, if you think about that, that's mind-boggling. If you think today, my Microsoft Band, if we look at uh, – uh, real-world commercial applications, you think of my Microsoft Band. It currently collects data on my health from the steps taken to calories consumed. All this information is being sent to a cloud. My scale is collecting data on my weight and BMI and sending this information to the cloud. There's these new refrigerators out that can, from the grocery store, I, you can use your cell phone to look at exactly uh, what's in your refrigerator. You can tell that in a couple years that all of this information will be correlated. And, it, and the three devices will someday be correlated and, and analysis be given and data to make intelligent recommendations for better health. So that's where we're heading. This is not just in commercial um, applications. It's in, for example, energy management and smart buildings. We currently have truly smart building available using IIoT, and as some like to refer to it as Building Internet of Things, or BIoT, in which all building control systems are accessible over the Internet and can therefore be controlled via any smart or mobile device. Uh, all this is becoming reality, and quite quickly. These smart office experiences can be anything from when you drive into the parking lot it senses your phone or license plate, then connects you to an application that assists you to find an available parking space. Outside the building, moisture sensors can ensure that the irrigation is only used when needed. And smart weather and now analytics determine whether it is worth waiting for it to rain or to run the sprinkler system. When entering the building, biometrics can recognize you and let you through security. Throughout the building, heating, lighting, cooling, are utilized more intelligently, and you can rate your comfort level so the application can learn how to make your workplace experience more comfortable. We have only scratched the surface of what is possible with smart buildings. I would recommend you look at one of a webinar that we did previously with the University of Texas in Austin. They have a smart energy building application, and you can see here some of the screens that exist. What is pushing some of these IoT and uh, some of these uh, applications is 
some of it is government. So, for example, the German government. There are many. It, it, one such initiative is Industry 4.0, which is the German government-sponsored vision for advanced manufacturing. The underlying concept of Industrial 4.0 is to connect embedded system and smart production facilities to generate a digital conversion between industry, business, and internal functions and process. They're not just evaluating the technology, they're also evaluating the processes. Industry 4.0 refers to the fourth industrial revolution and introduces the concept of cyber physical system to differentiate this new evolution phase from the electronic automation that has gone before. Although Industry 4.0 starts with advanced manufacturing, the ultimate impact will transcend production activities, will transcend into other segments, including utilities and smart cities, where at some point production activities will be coordinated, or even suspended for that matter, to accommodate increased energy demands within the smart grid and other elements of smart city. Industry 4.0 has some very strong players, such as uh, Siemens and Bosch Rexroth that play a strong role in this air area. Another initiative that's getting a lot of uh, play is Made in China 2025. It is an initiative to comprehensively upgrade the Chinese industry. The initiative draws direct inspiration from the German Industrial 4.0 plan, which was first discussed in 2011 and later adopted in 2013. The heart of the Industrial 4.0 idea is intelligent manufacturing, which is just applying the tools of information technology to production. The Chinese effort is far broader, as the efficiency and quality of the Chinese producers are highly uneven and multiple challenges need to be overcome in the short amount of time if China is to avoid being squeezed by newly emerging low-cost producers, such as Vietnam or Malaysia, or from, getting, uh, uh, or from advanced manufacturers like Germany. Uh, so they are trying to ensure their role in the long-term manufacturing world. The plan was drafted by the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology over two and a half years with input from about 150 experts from the Chinese market. They have several areas that they are focused on. As many know, uh, IoT is a big deal in the U.S. Uh, in fact, a new IoT startup is being born almost all the time. A study commissioned by the Oxford Economics shows that revenue growth is by far the biggest factor driving IoT adoption. Um, throughout 2016 and beyond, we'll continue to see IoT uh, deployed at mainstream path to generate higher revenue, thanks largely to four key trends that are happening right now. One is data monetization, core IoT networks, lower power devices, and platform as a service. According to business insiders, nearly $6 trillion will be spent on IoT solutions over the next five years. Manufacturers across all areas, both automotive, chemicals, durable goods, electronic oil and gas, have invested heavily in IoT devices and services. According to Business Insider Report, manufacturers utilize IoT solutions in 2014 saw an average of 28.5% increase in revenue between 2013 and 2014. They forecast that the investment in the IoT by manufacturers will translate to billions in spending. BI estimates the global manufacturers will invest $70 billion on IoT solutions in 2020. That's up from $29 billion in 2015. According to the BI, manufacturers are currently using IoT solutions to track assets in their factories, consolidate their control rooms, and increase their analytic functionality through predictive maintenance. Expectation that is, is that manufacturing will go to more complex applications, not the, just these that I've mentioned right now. Indusoft has done several IoT applications that I'll briefly touch on. One of them is PML. PML provides analysis, gas, and geo ge geological information to well site managers and remote office staff overseeing the drilling of the wells, mud locker. Reports were provided twice a day in order to update the rigs and office staff on the gas and geological conditions. 
some of these reports were being delayed by almost 12 hours. So what PML decided to do is offer a solution that uses Indusoft Web Studio and cloud capability to provide real-time data on the conditions of the well information site. Not only is the data monitored constantly by PML employees at the well site, it is also monitored by experts on the cloud. This is a case study and a webinar available on our website about the PML application. Another great, oops, my finger got a little too fast there. Another great IoT application is Conestoga Energy. Conestoga Energy uses Indusoft Web Studio for an IoT application that monitors, their, monitors crop water management or irrigation on the pivots. The farmers from their cell phone, tablets, or computers can monitor irrigation of their crops because of the pivots gets because if the pivots get stuck, it can overwater their crops or underwater their crops, making them lose huge amounts of money. They, they actually use a service from Conestoga Energy, which uses Indusoft Web Studio that is embedded, has embedded on the sensor on the pivot that sends real-time data to the cloud and does the analytics to let them monitor their pivots. Not only is Conestoga taking information off, the, uh, off of the pivots, they're also taking information off the weather feed to intelligently forecast the need to water the crops and, uh, as well. Once again, this case study is on our website as well as uh, the webinar is available as well. All of these IoT applications that we start with the data, and one of the things about InSoft Web Studio is that we have over 240 drivers that allow you to talk to various devices. This is either sensor data, contextual data, user input data, and more. The, the day, multiple embedded small devices can be set out there in uh, a remote area and send this information to a cloud-based historian such as Wonderware Online, which is an ideal IoT solution. As you know, the data is transmitted to either a data center or the cloud and where, the, where it can be analyzed and transformed into actionable insight. Indusoft Web Studio is an easy-to-use development environment, which is a full-feature HMI SCADA package that does allow you to build application, whether it's on a mobile device or on the cloud. Our newest product, IoT View, is a runtime environment that is less than three megabytes, which is a very small footprint that can actually be sitting on, a, on an embedded device. And it runs on both VxWorks as well as Linux. Once again, it has the ability to communicate to over 240 drivers and provides you remote access to viewing of your data through HTML5 browsers, which means a browser on your phone like your Apple phone or your Chrome or any of those uh, devices. In addition, in Soft Web Studio, database connectivity makes it easy to send data to not only a relational database on a cloud, or it can also be a Wonderware historian, which uh, Ray will talk about in a few minutes. And today, we will hear all about Wonderware Online and how it can be used in the IoT environment within Indusoft Web Studio. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ray to present. Good afternoon. Um, as Martin said, I'm Ray Norman. I'm a regional system consultant uh, for Wonderware. And as automation specialists, you in the audience have always actually been part of the Internet of Things. Uh, you're the Internet of Things right now. So what's really interesting in our um, organizations and in our businesses is they think this Internet of Things is brand new. Uh, as Wonderware, I've been a 20-year employee with Wonderware. Um, the old I.O. servers back in the day, Sweetling, DDE, Fast DDE servers, those were actually an Internet of Things. Um, you know, Net DDE, that was an Internet of Things. And so we've actually been dealing in the Internet of Things world for quite some time. It's just now we have capabilities of extending the Internet of Things from beyond just, say, the plant floor, or within the plant floor, the ability to connect numerous devices without having to say first go to a PLC or a remote terminal unit or a DCS. Um, approximately 16 months ago, uh, Indusoft asked me to speak about the Wonderware Historian. And we were talking about Indusoft 7.1 SP3, where we integrated the trend task into not just the proprietary capability of Indusoft 
uh, proprietary format, uh, database format, but also adding the capability of uh, having into soft data go into the Wonderware Historian or Industrial SQL Server as it's been known uh, in the past. Um, Wonderware Online um, is the newest generation of the Wonderware Historian where it's a historian provided as a managed service. And so we've taken just the basic on-premises historian and put it into the Azure cloud. It is a pure Azure application and can scale as very large as it needs to be. And so consequently, it's not limited to the number of users or the number of tags, say that an on-premises historian but really is, is unlimited, as unlimited as the Azure cloud. In addition to the capability of having uh, the Wonderware historian online.wonderware.com as an Azure uh, software as a service, there's a new set of desktop and mobile client tools as part of this. So you can visualize and interact, of, interact with the data on uh, Wonderware Online and also be alerted to plant KPIs and equipment uh, through, the, through the use of Smart Glance and the ability to create your own uh, alerts based on a particular key performance indicator, either exceeding a value or uh, minimum, uh, less than a value or between two values. So who's it for? It's really everybody. Anything, anything and anybody that would use a historian or that capability is also a potential customer for Wonderware Online. And where the differences are is Wonderware Online really allows multiple sites or multiple small sites to post their data to online to a tenant, what's called a tenant, and only those members that are part of that tenancy can see that information. And so consequently, if I have an OEM that um, uh, does a particular piece of equipment for water, wastewater, or say consumer packaged goods, they may be able to take that piece of OEM equipment and go ahead and securely connect it to the cloud, be able to uh, see the information from that tool, see the performance from that tool, and actually do diagnostics and remote diagnostics and performance increases, and also alerts to the customer itself that a particular problem is showing up on that tool and so consequently, um, it gives a proactive capability to OEMs and other users that uh, need more than just an on-premises capability. As I mentioned earlier, there's a new browser client, which is an HTML5 browser client, to visualize and uh, look at the data that exists on Wonderware Online. Um, the browser client is a fully featured um, um, Key perform set of key performance indicators, uh, a set of dashboards, a set of trend tools, downline tools, share tools, and we'll get into what this browser client can do. In addition, Wonderware Smart Glance is mobile and wearable clients where I can um, take the information that's posted onto Wonderware Online and then push it to a local device, either an um, uh, iPad, an iPhone, an Android phone, an Android pad, including Windows 10 um, uh, Surface pads. And so consequently, it's a mobile world, and being able to have that information capable as a mobile client and with you all the time is one of the key capabilities of Wonderware Online and these mobile clients. Wonderware Historian Client Trend is also a client tool, and this trend is available both as an executable, as an ActiveX, or as a .NET control. In the demo that I'm going to be doing later, we'll see the trend ActiveX in Indosoft Web Studio as just an ActiveX, although Indusoft Web Studio could have also taken the .NET uh, control as part of the historian client trend. Here's the connection uh, server list for uh, historian client trend. And so consequently, the historian client can connect to both a local historian or an on-premise historian and also connect to the online historian. And so it has the capabilities of connecting to multiple historian or multiple instances and also multiple tenancies all at one time. So if we look at some of the capabilities of the online client, which is called Insight, we first have a status board view to understand what is happening right now. We see the current value of um, what's happening. We see a trend uh, overall time um, of uh, a trend diagnostic up or down, and a status board view or a, pen, a um, trend tail that says, okay, where have we been over the last uh, eight hours or last shift? The summary chart shows the actual values uh, as relationship to their um, uh, maximum and minimum spans, and we can also logically organize those with additional hashtags or metadata 
so that when we're creating dashboards or when we're searching for information, we can search for this additional metadata. It's not just maybe a tag name, but something associated where I have many different tag names associated with additional metadata tags, hashtags, and so consequently it makes it easier to find the information instead of some esoteric tag name like a TIC 3072. Once you have the information, you can get it, share it, download it, embed it. And the kind of items that can be shared and downloaded, first is the URL of the uh, trend or the uh, summary that you're looking at. So you can share it to other members of the organization that have access to Wonderwear Online. You can embed it in additional uh, tools such that um, um, you can uh, do a link to that directly to that item. You can download the information contained uh, within the trend. An example would be, we'll show this, you just download the CSV of the data behind the trend. You can share with mobile, where I'm then taking that information and sending it to Smart Glance. So I have that information in a mobile environment for my iPhone, my Android phone, and such. And then finally, save for later, where I want to say, I really like that particular trend that I put together and how it's set up, I want to go ahead and save that for later. And when I do save that for later, it encourages me to add those additional uh, hashtags so that uh, um, I can search for that information later on and have access to it very quickly. When we're looking at just trends, and for the most part, if we look at process data, a trend is the visualization component that humans are most um, likely to look at time series data although there are met other methodologies for looking at that information. But the most common is trend. And so with this trend, it's a very beautiful trend from afar, and, but um, I then can uh, click on the screen itself, and as I drag my cursor back and forth on the screen, I then can see well, what are the actual values for that with the trend cursor and what time they are and uh, what their actual values. So you've got nice trends from afar and detailed when you need it up close. Because of the different chart types in the galaxy, you can toggle the different selections in the, in the uh, tag view. I can add tags, um, um, uh, reduce tags, or reuse the number of tags for a particular view. Uh, and then also then uh, in the gallery, select the different views that I want. So here's an example of a, uh, a bar chart where I'm looking at um, you know, information over time for that particular uh, temperature, say. We can also add limit alerts and highlight limits and specs for quick assessment so I can see that I exceeded a particular limit or um, um, I'm below a particular limit. And um, so it gives a nice visual indication of where am I and where should I be. One of the dashboard items when you first bring up uh, online insight <clears throat> is this news feed that looks at all the tags that are part of the tenancy. And in that tenant, it's looking at trends over time. And then based on simple machine learning, it's looking to see, well, are there anomalies? And so here in the um, uh, data anomaly section for the news feed, I can see that uh, my pressure hey, say it was higher than normal, or say in my wind direction was lower than normal. And so it's doing this continually in the background against all the tags that are in that particular uh, tenant. Smart Glance is the mobile client for uh, Wonderware Online. And Smart Plants is also available as a standalone component itself. But it's a, a key piece of Wonderware Online, and it's a key piece of one of the client tools. So when I say that I want to send information to the mobile client, uh, we saw that dialogue earlier, I then see all the reports, and the re most recent reports are at the top. I've got an instant search feature, so if I have lots of reports, I can um, distinguish within, between them. And once I've selected a particular report, I've got a quick summary view where I saw the, uh, the latest read and also a little trend tale of what's been happening. And I can also then um, do a long press on a particular tag to set an alert or view more information on that, uh, on that uh, particular tag and see what it's been doing. We can plot up to six tags at one time, but sometimes if I've got too much data, it kind of gets in the way. And so you can also then turn, um, uh, toggle the tags on and off. So I can either look at uh, multiple values in relationship to each other or zero in on a particular item for, uh, uh, for interest. When we've selected a particular tag for a push notification or an alert, it means that I want to be able to create a self-prepared um, alert 
that um, I'm going to have my iPhone or Android phone um, either buzz or send a particular tone, just like you can set different ringtones for uh, different people calling you or different tones if you had, say, a, a text come in. You've got the same capability with Wonderware Smart Glance in these push notifications and alerts. If I've selected lots of alerts for me, I can also then click on the alert button and it will show a list of all alerts. One of the more recent things that we've added to Smart Glance is also the ability to put it to sleep. That is, I don't want alerts uh, between 10 at night and 7 in the morning. And so consequently, you have that capability of saying, you know, uh, you, I might get alerts overnight, but I'm not going to wake myself up with those uh, tones uh, overnight. So once you've added that alert uh, to that, and again, it's a slow um, uh, uh, finger push onto the particular tag, it just says, notify me when, then the tag name uh, is greater than or equal to a particular item, is greater than, greater than, to less than, or between two particular items, uh, say between 15 and 30, go ahead and notify me. I still don't have a use case for that one. Certainly a level alert I can see, but I don't have a use case for between two values at this time. I'm uh, kind of curious about uh, a good use case for that. So when we look at uh, multiple tags, uh, we can use different engineering units uh, on their own relative scale, and the multiple tail, uh, tags use uh, the common axis on the Y, and uh, they may be the same engineering units or other engineering units. And so here's an example of multiple engineering units on the same display. If I've got items that have the same type of engineering unit, um, in this case here it's um, um, temperature, I then have the same capability as um, the online um, uh, insight uh, tool where I can slide along a cursor and see the current time and actually also the current values uh, of that as well. And so I have a trend that is local to my pocket. I have that plant information or that particular um, um, uh, machine information at my fingertips at all times. And it has many different form factors. Of course, your iPhone or your Android phone or a smartwatch can also be a client tool for Smart Glance Online. So let's look at how this is all put together. Now, where this all started, of course, was with Wonderware. And when we originally put Wonderware Online um, in, in service, InTouch was the primary data provider for Wonderware Online. And then the clients themselves, we had historian client trend, um, modern browsers, because this is HTML5 based. So I can use Internet Explorer, Edge, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, whatever. And then Smart Glance mobile devices um, for looking at that information that's also contained in Wonderware Online. We also had the Wonderware historian as a tier one historian pushing data to Wonderware Online. Well, since then, we've opened up the entire product family from Schneider Electric for pushing data to Wonderware Online. So uh, Veo SciTech, uh, of course, the Wonderware Historian SDK, Good Old Classic InTouch, Indisoft, ClearSCADA, um, OPC and OI servers, because they also have the capability of sending data to Wonderware Online, and MQTT. Now, we have multiple mechanisms for sending MQTT-type data to Wonderware Online. The first is through Indisoft Web Studio itself. With Indisoft Web Studio 8.0, we introduced the capability of a new I.O. type called MQTT. With the OI server, the Gateway, uh, which Wonderware recently released, um, I believe on uh, July 7th, we also have MQTT capability through the OI server. Uh, we're working in the fall to release direct MQTT information to Wonderware Online. So I don't have to go through uh, any local device first. I can go directly from MQTT directly to uh, Wonderware Online. Some of the other technologies that are used with Wonderware Online, I mentioned HTML5 for the browser itself for the you know, Wonderware Insight, but the actual payload and what um, um, uh, we're using with Wonderware Online is actually an OData interface uh, with JavaScript object notation formatting um, and what this allows us to do is have a very secure uh, access to uh, information online, and, um, but nonetheless, um, um, I, have, I have that information. So if those of you who are acquainted with the Wonderware historian know that the Wonderware historian uses structured query language to extract the information that's contained in a history block. Uh, the little uh, refresher, 
um, the one we're storing, although we use Microsoft SQL Server, we don't store the data in row column form in a database. It's actually stored in what's called a history block. And then I use structured query language and extensions to transact SQL to extract the information out of that um, a history block, but then present it in structured query language form. Well, one of the challenges of using structured query language across the internet is that's a security hole and a security problem. And so consequently, to create a secure environment for OneDoor Online, we had to use a mechanism that is um, suitable for a, um, an internet-based historian, and that's uh, OData and JavaScript object notation. Now, the historian client trend itself can use structured query language if it's going to an on-premise historian. It can also use OData and JavaScript object notation payloads when it's looking to an online historian. As a little example of what the OData URL looks like, here's an example of that, say, going against uh, historian syscon set. And so as you can see, it's a relatively long URL. And uh, in the fall, we'll also be releasing a Office 365 Excel um, add-in so that uh, the Excel add-in can build this URL without having to hand type it itself. Similar in nature to how Query in the WonderWare historian um, and also the Excel add-in for the on-premise WonderWare historian builds the structured query language for an on-premise historian. We're doing the same thing for WonderWare Online and Office 365. So if we go into the covers and how does the data actually get from InnoSoft Web Studio to WonderWare Online, first off, we have to use the Studio Database Gateway because all external calls to a database use the gateway. So consequently, I can have it all within one um, uh, computer either running Windows 7 through Windows 10, Server 2008 through 2012 R2, I'm using the local gateway uh, for that. And then when I go out the gateway, the historian client abstraction layer uses port 32568, outbound only, and it uses transport layer security um, uh, for that. So it is encrypted um, um, when it's sent to Wonderware Online. And on the other end, um, using the, uh, the JSON format, um, I, we also have then a 128, I believe it's 128 character um, key that's part of the security for getting it back out of WonderWare Online. In the case of using Intisoft Web Studio on, let's say, a, uh, a CE device, uh, Windows Embedded uh, Compact, um, I can't run the Studio Gateway on that Compact with all of the um, um, utilities or the DLLs required for talking to WonderWare Online. And so consequently, I would use uh, the standard gateway port um, and uh, port uh, 3997, and I would talk to a gateway running on a Microsoft computer, Windows 7 through Windows 10, through 2008 through 2012 R2, and then from there on out to WonderWare Online, again using port 32568 and transport layer security. So consequently, going through the firewall, it's outbound only. It makes um, the IT department very happy. It only uses a single port. That also makes sure that the IT department is happy with that. And again, it is outbound only. Cybersecurity is a really big deal for Wonderware, as it should be. And one of the things that Wonderware does is we actually um, have three different companies that we have hired that actually attack all of our software. And this is also a Schneider Electric thing. Um, we want to know if there's a problem or a defect or an attack vector um, uh, before the bad guys find that vector. And so all data transmission encryption storage uh, is secured with encryption, you know, just like your bank. And again, that data is uh, uh, outbound only, but we still use those third-party um, um, applications and so third-party um, uh, folks to attack our software as well. Now, one of the things that is unique to the Wonder Historian it is continuous monitoring and auditing of improvements for the standard out-of-the-box offering for WonderWare, but it does run on Microsoft's Azure Cloud and um, using Azure data centers and also Azure Active Directory um, for um, the authentication uh, against WonderWare Online. You can start with WonderWare Online immediately because there's a free demo. You can sign up uh, with a small tenancy to get started and go play with. 
Um, we've got a live chat. We've got a series of videos that you can watch of how to get started with Wonderware Online, and also how to use the Insight Client. And the same thing with uh, Wonderware Smart Glance. Um, you can download the Smart Glance app from your favorite app store. Uh, download also the mobile reporting connector so you can push additional data to your, um, to your device, not necessarily just through Wonderware Online. And then register yourself for a free trial at online.wonderware.com. For Wonderware Smart Glance, the client tools, you can go to iTunes to uh, download uh, Smart Glance. You can go to Google Play to download the Android uh, version of Smart Glance or to the Windows Store to uh, download uh, the Windows um, um, form of Smart Glance for your Windows 10 device or your Surface device. All right, let's go ahead and uh, uh, show how this works and we'll just uh, go on to uh, fearless demo time. And uh, I've got a virtual machine here running uh, Indusoft Web Studio uh, 8.0 with, uh, I believe, patch uh, 3. And um, um, <clears throat> the connection to um, the Wonderware historian is through the trend task. And as you may recall, um, from Indusoft um, 7.1 SB3 and later, we've had the ability to go to a Wonderware historian beyond just proprietary format and database format. And so if I look at Wonderware historian in the configuration, I have an on-premises, and so I'm currently going to an on-premises. This is my server machine name, my login information, and um, I'm, so I'm going to a local historian. If I want to go to, the, to Wonderware Online, I first have to create a connection to the Wonderware Online, and that's done through the gateway itself. So if I open up Studio Database Gateway, and I'll say I want to do a Wonderware Online connection, and I'll create a new online connection. And I'll call this IWS underscore one. Now, previously I've created this, and we'll see some dialogues. Of what if I wanted to create a new connection or add to a connection? Um, uh, we'll see some of the dialogues of uh, uh, adding data to an existing connection. And uh, so I'll go ahead and add that. So the first thing it's going to do is going to um, uh, uh, prompt me to sign in to Wonderware Online. So then I'll establish a connection to Wonderware Online, and um, I'll have to then do um, uh, my connection against the uh, Microsoft Azure Active Directory. So in the onboarding of different users to Wonderware Online, uh, the administrator can invite additional people to a particular tenancy because Wonderware Online is a multi-tenant solution. Um, those users would uh, receive an email from Wonderware Online. Um, uh, they would then click on the link and create their own password for the Azure authentication, and, um, uh, and then they're authenticated for that particular tenancy against Wonderware Online. Now, my password for my little demo system is ray.wonderware at gmail.com. And you might ask, well, Ray, how come you're not using ray.norman at, uh, ray at wonderware.com? Uh, and the answer is I have currently have um, five different online accounts, Wonderware Online accounts, that I use both for demo purposes as well as testing purposes uh, for, for our own development and, and marketing. And so ray.norman at wonderware.com is used, um, uh, ray.norman at inventions.com is used, ray.norman at schneiderelectric.com is used, and so I created this particular user, ray.wonderware at gmail.com, for our purposes. And then my password. Um, that password um, does have complexity constraints um, that are enforced by the uh, Azure Active Directory. And so it has to have a capital letter, it has to have numbers, and, uh, uh, and also have, it has to exceed, uh, I believe, eight characters. <clears throat> And so you can see the applications that I've published to this particular um, uh, tenancy, and I'll reuse one of them. And because I'm reusing one of them, I'm going to get a new pop-up that says, you know, go back and enter a new game, um, um, you know, replace uh, this tenancy with a new tenancy, or go ahead and share the data source. And I'm going to share this data source because I'm just uh, reconnecting as part of a, uh, this online demo. So what's happening in the background is it's generating then a 512 character key that is uh, stored um, um, uh, with that device and with that um, um, uh, gateway. 
And that's the key that the gateway uses in talking to uh, Wonderware Online. It consists of an identification of um, the gateway itself, the computer, um, the, uh, its appropriate logins, and it's using the administrator, uh, which is um, um, uh, um, um, uh, secured as well. And so there's a, a multi-factor um, security that's uh, all part of that 512-character uh, key that uh, comes back and is stored on the local computer. And it just looks like gibberish when you look at it because it is encrypted. So I'll go ahead and close that. And now the gateway knows how to talk to uh, Wonderware Online. And I'll go ahead and minimize that, go to the historian configuration, and say, I want to go to Wonderware Online or the cloud. And it remembered that I used the IWS underscore one uh, connection name from my previous demo. And we're going to give it to IWS, we'll enable store and forward. Um, and I didn't mention this uh, when I was looking at the architecture, but at every layer in the architecture, from the uh, Indosoft um, uh, Web Studio to the gateway, they're store and forwarding to the gateway. From the gateway to the historian itself, they're store and forward. And so consequently, you have store and forward buffering across the entire interface of going to Wonderware Online. We'll go ahead and say OK. And I'll go ahead and save that. As soon as I save that, I then have that information and that connection is made to uh, Wonderware Online. And so if I um, uh, look at what I'm doing here, I can see that uh, um, um, items that I'm uh, forwarding and their timestamp, um, uh, again, that. And so uh, I then can go to Wonderware Online and see that. And so first off, low, let's go ahead and go to um, uh, Indosoft Web Studio and Features. And I added a historian trend to um, uh, this particular demo. And so it's asking me now to sign in for Wonderware Online so I can see that. So I'll go ahead and log in, ray.wonderware uh, at uh, gmail.com. And my password. And go ahead and log in. Uh, and fat fingers, make sure it counts. I kind of like that much better. Yeah. And so this um, historian client trend is the ActiveX version of historian client. And as soon as we're signed in, we'll see that uh, in the servers pane that, um, excuse me, that we uh, have access both to a local historian as well as the online historian. So I could log into my local historian and see information for my local historian. I can also then go to the online and be able to then select items from the, um, the tags that have been sent to, um, to uh, Historian Online. And you can see now the new data that we're sending to it and put it in live mode and, um, um, and see that we're actually updating on a regular basis as we're sending uh, that information to uh, Wonderware Online. The next thing we'll do is go to the online client itself. And so I'll go ahead and bring up clone. Um, so uh, Wonderware Online. It's just online.wonderware.com. And I'll go ahead and uh, log off and log back on since I had that open previously. And uh, go to online, go ahead and log in. And so as you saw earlier in one of the PowerPoint slides, any additional content that I'd created previously I would see a suggested content or dashboards. And then um, uh, on my news feed, if there was anything that was uh, uh, interesting about the, the data that was sent to, um, to uh, Wonderware Online, it will also give me uh, information on, on that as well. One of the interesting things that you can do with historian data is do what is called state retrieval. And so here we're actually sending a string to uh, Wonderware Online. This is through another component. Uh, through uh, actually in touch, um, but it can tell me how long I was uh, um, in a backwash state, say not backwashing, filtered away, slow clearance, you know, and using what is called state retrieval out of the Wonderware Historian. State retrieval has been a component in the Wonderware Historian now for almost eight years, and I just absolutely love state retrieval on what uh, uh, the, the um, information that you can extract out of the Historian using state retrieval. So one of the items and one of the uh, key characteristics of uh, Insight 
is I can really just, you know, start typing stuff. I really don't need to know anything because it'll first, you know, give me some, um, you know, basic information um, for what's there. But if I just say type uh, IWS because we had uh, IWS, um, and so it says, all right, here's all my IWS uh, tags itself. And so if I want to say, um, you know, take a look at all of them or add those tags, um, you know, I have, um, you know, the first uh, uh, five tags that are items. If I have more, I can also add those or delete those as required um, for that in my base um, um, uh, uh, gallery of the status board. Uh, the next gallery item would be um, um, a line chart. And since uh, the data is going very, very fast, and, and uh, um, we can see that I've, uh, yesterday in my demo this morning, been running it all day, and then I've come back, uh, high resolution data, uh, we then can take that information and either share it to other devices, embed it, or let's download it and take a look at it, uh, the download. And so it'll take the information that's in the background here, the raw data, and then go ahead and um, give you that in, uh, in raw format. And so my tag name, my date time, the actual value, if I had units there, what the units be, quality, quality status. And for all my, ten, all my pens for that particular time span, and you can see we've got uh, close to um, 65,000, 6,500 rows um, um, as a part of that uh, data set that provided, um, that was comprised from our numeric data from the trend. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to, uh, back to Marcia if there's any um, 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 questions, any, any questions that have come up. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, run that down. Thank you so much. That was great. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, are there any questions? Okay, I see a few of them coming in now. Um, one of them is, uh, what is MQTT? Um, um, oh, I'm trying to think of that. <laughs> what the acronym for MQTT is. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things about being 62 is I have nine grandchildren. One of the bad things about being 62 is the retrieval method. Um, uh, message, um, it's a Q messaging protocol. Q telemetry, is it? Yeah, is it telemetry. Uh, uh, right. Message Q, telemetry, telemetry, anyway. Um, so NCTT is really emerging as an open source. It was actually done by IBM uh, about eight years ago for uh, oil and gas oil and gas telemetry, where um, um, very very low bandwidth um, um, was required for looking at some of these uh, oil and gas remote terminal units. Uh, they only had uh, fractional uh, baud rates, uh, less than 9600 baud. In some cases, around 2400 baud. And one of the unique characteristics of MQTT is the actual payload package is extremely small and tiny. In fact, it's smaller than just the header of um, uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. So consequently, um, um, uh, it's a very efficient protocol. It's a publish, uh, subscribe, and publish protocol, and it uses a gateway uh, or a, um, a utility uh, running somewhere, either on the plant or uh, in the cloud itself, to um, to do the publish to and subscribe from. And there's multiple method, methods of quality of service as part of that. Um, and it's emerging as uh, as the protocol for the public um, uh, Internet of Things. So, um, um, you know, well, the first question, um, um, uh, do you see this, uh, Marcia, uh, potentially using a Linux runtime? Yeah, it says I can see a lot of potential in using a Linux runtime and saving process or customer-generated IoT or IIoT data. How could the Linux runtime, for instance, be used with Wonderware Online? Well, if we remember back to the slide, and I'm going to um, share my desktop again, share my screen, and let's go back to the slide where I showed um, the um, architecture. So this would be an example right here of if this was a Linux device or a VxWorks device, it would just have to then attach to a gateway. So I could have, you know, one, two, five, ten of these uh, Linux devices um, uh, or uh, VxWorks devices or Windows CE devices uh, talking to a common gateway um, um, uh, within the process or in the plant network, and then from there to Wonderware Online. 
And uh, so consequently, it again uses that gateway as the tool for actually getting to Wonderwear Online. So um, from Linux, uh, from uh, your um, um, uh, VxWorks, from um, a, uh, you know, uh, any devices that are supported, CE, whatever, um, it first has to go through the gateway and then from the gateway onto, uh, onto Wonderwear Online. Okay, there are a couple other ones that came in through the private chat. So does all Indusoft runtime support connection to Wonderware Online, or it, it only has. applicable to IoT view? No. Um, it has to be, um, um, for on-premise historian, it has to be version 7.1 SP3 or later. For Wonderware Online, it has to be 8.0, I believe, patch 2 for Wonderware Online. Now we're currently at patch three, so uh, uh, 80, 80 patch two or later. Um, uh, we're currently at 80 patch three, so um, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a um, Microsoft device. It could be a VxWorks device, a Linux device. Um, uh, IoT View uh, could also work. Um, I did a presentation and a demonstration a uh, month ago um, with one of our uh, Wonderware distributors, where I had a, um, a Raspberry Pi and I was getting data from a device via Modbus and to the Raspberry Pi, sending MQTT data um, to um, Wonderware Historian and also sending additional data to um, uh, Wonderware Historian through two different trend tasks. If I go back and share uh, my uh, screen again and go back to my device over here um, and minimize, and go back to uh, Development Studio. Um, each trend task can go to a different device. So I could have one trend task that was going proprietary, let's say it's going to create a new one um, um, using proprietary. Um, I could have another uh, trend task going to a database, a third trend task going to a uh, on-premises historian, or a fourth trend task going to the Wonder Online Cloud. So consequently, each trend task can go to a different um, a destination, a local destination, historian destination, cloud destination. And um, so there's uh, multiple methods that uh, you can send data to. Whatever data repository is appropriate for the tags that are part of that, um, uh, that uh, particular trend task. Okay, great. There's another one that came in that says, why would, I use, why would I want to use an online historian versus using a relational database on the cloud? Um, that's an excellent question. And, um, and the answer is, well, it depends. Using a relational database in the cloud means that uh, you as the end user has to, has to pretty much create the schema and also create uh, the, um, um, uh, the query tools, uh, also create the security. Uh, create um, the cleanup tasks, um, and, uh, but there are cases where that's the appropriate technology to use. Uh, Indusoft Web Studio has amazing database capability through many, many different databases, not just SQL Server, but Sybase or, or uh, um, uh, MySQL or, or uh, Oracle, and, uh, and there are cases where it's the appropriate technology. And, um, but uh, um, in not all cases does one solution solve all problems. And uh, also if you had your own SQL Server database in the cloud, then you would have to be uh, in charge of your own security and making sure that the connections from the facility, um, um, you know, through the facility's firewalls and, and such, um, have the appropriate um, security typically, um, you know, Something would be maybe external, uh, like a, a VPN or something like that. But then the onus would be on the end user to make sure that that connection is secure. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things, one of the reasons why we do not use structured query language on the online historian is because of SQL injection attacks and the attack vectors that are opened up when using SQL um, in a, a cloud format. But uh, there are cases where it's the appropriate technology. And so um, uh, it's just another tool in your belt to be used um, when it's appropriate. And um, sometimes, you know, the proprietary format is the appropriate technology. Okay, and here's another one that says, is there a way to configure multiple users in Windows Online and filter the accessible data per user? Yes, you can. Um, if I go back to um, my uh, online tool, go ahead and share the desktop again. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and go to my online. Um, if I go to apps and to my administration app, um, um, the administration app is where I can invite additional users um, to um, the organizational list. And then I can also then, um, um, you know, from there, also say what um, um, items um, and, um, you know, tags, all data, only data from a particular uh, source. And so consequently, I can uh, restrict individual users from what information that is available. So an example would be, let's say I'm an OEM and, um, um, and I sell uh, equipment and as part of the equipment service, um, I have uh, all the um, uh, pieces of equipment sending data to Wonderware Online. Um, I then would want customer one only be able to see customer one's data and not to see customer two or customer three. Um, and also within your own organization, uh, you may not want to expose thousands and thousands of uh, data sources and tags um, for a particular uh, user that really only needs uh, access to, you know, five or six customers' data. And so consequently, you have uh, the capability of um, restraining um, uh, individual users to a particular uh, tenancy or a particular data source. And uh, coming uh, real soon, coming actually in the next, um, uh, uh, what's called the next drop, uh, is the ability to do it on a per tag basis. And currently it's on a, a data source, but we'll also be able to do that on a per tag basis uh, in the next drop. And what I mean by that is every uh, 90 days, uh, there's a new drop put onto Wonderware Online. And so uh, you get new capabilities both in the historian, uh, new capabilities in uh, Insight. And so uh, it's continually being improved. And the main benefit of this is there's nothing the user has to install. Uh, just like any uh, cloud service or uh, software as a service, um, there's nothing, you don't have to take something down and, and, and install something on the client. Um, it's all done uh, server side. Okay, there's another question before we uh, end the conference. Is, is the Wonderware Online licensed by connected seats or by registered users? It's licensed by the number of registered users. It is a uh, subscription, a uh, yearly subscription, and um, uh, it's not limited to the number of tags or number of data providers. Uh, it is purely subscription-based by the number of users uh, at this point in time. Uh, I don't know of any interest in um, uh, going to a different um, uh, format, but uh, it's a subscription-based system, just like a lot of uh, online systems are subscription-based, and it's, uh, subscri it's subscribed on a, on a per-user basis. Excellent. If there are no other questions, uh, we will end this webinar, and I want to say if you come up with a question, please feel free to send it to info at indusoft.com or give us a call at uh, 877 Indusoft, and we will be more than happy to try and assist you with integration both with the Indusoft Web Studio and with the Wonderware Online. Ray, I can't thank you enough. You did a great job, and I appreciate uh, your support in this. Well, thank you, Marcia. As, you, as I've told you in the past, the Wonderware Historian is one of my favorite products. And uh, thank you for the time to uh, be able to speak about uh, one of my favorite products. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a great day, mm -hmm. everyone.